Hey folks, what's going on? We're back here in the print farm. Really gonna, how did that happen? Gotta be honest with you, I don't remember loading filament into the Creality, but that was where I was gonna get to, is get the nozzle swapped out for another 0.6 millimeter nozzle over on uh, that machine there, the V3 SE from Creality. So I've had a lot of people ask me about this little setup here for the V3 SE and what I did to get it working. And honestly, I'm not really sure, but you don't need to do that because Creality has this great little thing here called the Sonic Pad. It's not just for one printer. If you have more machines, you can use it on up to four Creality machines, making it a little bit easier to control everything. All right, this guy just finished uploading filament. And I guess I could just got regular PLA in there. So we'll go into the G code. So I just loaded up one of the 18 millimeter push sticks. This is something I normally print on the V3 SE, but I've been having issues with it. So these guys down here have been taking the lead. And I've also been printing out some test prints with PETG over on the Flash Forge Adventure 5M Pro. So far, there hasn't been anything that I've actually put in this machine that hasn't printed yet. I was going to try printing with some carbon fiber nylon or nylon carbon fiber, however you want to say it. Uh, but it recommended that I anneal it afterwards, and I don't really have a great way of doing that. I've heard you can also do a process called wet annealing where you soak it first, uh, and then you bring it back into the environment and let it dry out. And uh, I guess that's a pretty good way of doing it as well. So I may try that out. Uh, here in a couple days. So I'm just printing out a vacuum adapter like I was printing out over on the Adventure 5M Pro, except this one is out of Elegoo's matte PLA. It prints super fast with PLA. You have to slow it down a little bit when you're moving to some of those higher temperature filaments. So I just want to see how quick can we actually get this printed out of PLA. So this has supports enabled. And I think it's a 30 or 32 minute print over on the Adventure 5M Pro from Flash Forge. It was a little over an hour, but that was also out of PETG. So maybe not a completely fair test. So the way I've got this set up right now is at 175 on the uh, outer wall and 275 on the inner wall. The infill is where this thing gets crazy. It's like six or 700 millimeters per second. But unfortunately, this particular piece doesn't have any infill. It is just walls. And the S1 Pro's also got a built-in filament holder and dryer. It heats up to 65 degrees Celsius, I believe. Let's see, we can go into filament 60. So 55 to 60 range on filament dryer inside of here. So that should be enough for up to PETG anyway, especially since it's inside of the enclosed chamber here. So right now my speeds for PLA over on the FL Sun S1 Pro. First layer, 50, 80, outer wall and inner wall in the lower range. And then sparse infill is where it gets crazy. So you can see FL Sun recommends uh, 400 on the outer wall, 500 on the inner wall, 800 sparse infill, 500 internal solid infill. And well, you can see the rest. And actually, surprisingly, the print quality at those speeds isn't bad. It did not have enough time to cool up at the top, even though it was printing five of these at a time. Um, it still was pretty warm up there as it got towards the top. It was didn't really have enough time to cool before it switched back. Uh, again, I had these printed with a 0.6 millimeter nozzle. So you will see some of the results from this machine out of different filaments in an upcoming video. This is some PETG from Elegoo printed over on the S1 Pro from FL Sun. T overall, not bad. And I will show you those speeds here right now. So I believe these were the speed settings that I had set up for this uh, Benchy here. And you can definitely see those areas inside where it was doing uh, some infill. Wasn't the cleanest, but we can switch back to PLA. You can see we have 31 minutes and 50 seconds, 66 grams, and there is 497 layers. Pretty nuts. And now these are the settings that are set up for PETG over on the Adventure 5M Pro. I have not changed anything about this. In fact, I think I even increased the outer wall and inner wall settings a little bit. You can see an hour and 19 minutes. And as you can see right here, just completed hour and 16 minutes later. 
The only thing I'm still working on tuning with this machine is getting the flow rate dialed in. For me, it's just kind of easier to bump it up by 0.01 or something and then see how it comes out. Whatever this little line is there. And then my inability to turn on supports because I prefer not to. And it's just a vacuum adapter. Like, I don't really care. You can see where we're at with the uh, same vacuum adapter. I guess I shouldn't put that in there, but uh, this is printing out over on the S1 Pro in Elegoo's matte PLA. See, this is where we're at now. Right now, I'm just using standard PLA from Elegoo. Maybe you can see it more like right around there. I think that's more related to the 0.6 millimeter nozzle than it is to the nozzle itself being messy. I, I don't know for sure. Because this doesn't look all that bad, at least from my perspective. But uh, this guy over on the V3 SE takes a little over three hours. Uh, almost four, actually. Three hours and 50 minutes. And over on the A1 Mini, the same exact push stick takes two hours and 45 minutes. And in tomorrow's video, I have about 100 dumbbells that I need to get sent out to Amazon, as well as, I don't know, 20 or 30 of the sander holders, I think. I went on to Amazon the other night to just check things out, and they recommended that I send like 87 of those dumbbells. So I'm just going to send some extra. I've got probably... 30 or 40 of them sitting here right now as far as the dumbbells go anyway and i don't know probably 20 of those as well and speaking of amazon my buddy roger over at 10 mile creations just posted this video the other day about his brutal journey getting set up with amazon handmade if you're not subscribed to roger's channel 10 mile creations i'll put a link down for him in the description below too he's still growing on here he's got a lot of great modeling content though so if you're interested in all that type of stuff and uh the, some of the new stuff that he's putting out go check him out with 10 mile creations link in the description below anyway his video was more about uh his struggles in setting up amazon fba and particularly amazon homemade and I haven't played around with Amazon Homemade. I've only used the Amazon uh, Individual and the Amazon Professional Seller account. So I was really interested to see uh, his process with the Handmade store. And these things really just make more sense for me to print out and send to Amazon than they do for me to individually pack them up. They're really not worth it in overall costs that it takes for me to process them individually anyway. So I'm going to send a couple packs of some of the dogs that I don't have on there right now. And I had a couple of you point out in my year-end review video on Etsy that I didn't really take into account things like, oh, rent, electricity costs, the cost of the models. So I do have a video on where I get my models from. So some of them are paid subscriptions on things like the dogs over there from KE Creations. And I believe that's around $10, $12 a month for the plan that I'm on. And I mentioned I was also going to be scaling back. So I am cutting down on some of the things that aren't selling or aren't really worth my time in terms of how much it takes to prep them before they go out. And this year, I really want to work on making my own designs, coming up with things that I need around the shop or in my house, in my daily life, or things that you guys suggest to me in the comments down below. So I really took 2024 to just slowly grow the Etsy and Amazon Mountain Maker brand slowly over the course of 2024, while I had other sources of income like a job. So I could sit here and tell you that Etsy ads were 100% worth it just to get those reviews up. And in a way, they kind of were. But as my buddy Chris over at Off The Bench pointed out, it's really best to try and have 20% of your sales come from your ad spend, whereas 80% of those sales should be from organic sales. You bringing in traffic, things that are just naturally clicked on by customers, nothing that is a paid for placement. So at the time, I thought they were a 100% good idea to just leave on. So I'm also going to put a link in the description below to Chris's video over on his channel, Off The Bench. Uh, the video is titled Etsy Ads and What You Need To Know. One of the things that I learned from Chris in that video was that your Etsy ads have certain keywords that are linked to them. Like for my page, I found out a lot of my Etsy ad clicks were coming from people searching for the Mountain Maker or Mountain Maker 3D. So I appreciate that. But anyway, you can go into the related tags inside of Etsy ads and shut off things that are bringing in clicks but aren't really bringing in sales or turn off things that don't necessarily relate directly to the product. So for instance, my sander holders, while they are a Festool product, they're not a Festool Domino. And I've never gotten a sale from somebody searching Festool Domino and clicking on the sander holder. But I've had to pay because somebody searched Festool Domino and clicked on the sander holder. So check out uh, Chris's video over at Off The Bench if you are interested in having Etsy ads on, but also saving some money on. 
And in the time that it took me to tell you all that stuff, we are 72% complete at 30 minutes. I believe the total time with these tree supports in there was about 39 minutes. I'm honestly kind of surprised those tree supports are still in there considering how quickly it is printing them, but I said it's a good thing for the machine, right? So after I got everything leveled out, I've been having some successful prints out of PETG and out of uh, PLA on here, but this is ASA and it prints really hot uh, on the bed. It's 105 Celsius on the bed versus PLA, which I have at 60. So I have it recalibrate the bed mesh before it prints it, but that still doesn't seem to be working. Uh, and I know ASA and ABS are prone to warping, but to me, that doesn't look like my first layer is quite squished enough but I'm also not getting very good uh, results. Like it starts printing okay, the, the uh, actual side of it looks pretty good, and then it just pops off the bed. So maybe I need to use some sort of Magigoo. I mean, it says ABS. Uh, let me know if you guys have used this stuff on ASA and had luck with it. I know ABS and uh, ASA are pretty similar. Let me know down below if you've had issues getting ASA to stick and what you do to fix it. I haven't had too many issues over on the Flash Forge printing the ASA, although this one in particular, either the cooling settings weren't quite right or it started to warp. If I remember correctly, I think it started to lift. This was the front of the piece, and I think it started to lift up off the bed here, so I ended up stopping it because it was going to fail. But I really do like the ASA. Uh, it's super durable stuff but kind of a pain in the butt to print with, especially over on the S1 Pro, just due, I think, to the nature of how the S1 Pro cools. It's pretty different from your typical, you know, cooling fan. It's a CPAP style fan that comes in from down here and then feeds in there. So there's a lot more airflow coming out of that than there is from your traditional 3D printer, you know, little tiny fan. So that's been kind of interesting tweaking the settings and learning how the fan on that works versus some of the other printers that I have. So some of the issues I'm having with the Creality, as you can see here, it always seems to happen right about there, that little line. And then I get it up here as well. It happens with every, uh, every filament and every print that I do with this. And it's even calibrated for uh, vibration compensation. So it's something to do with the nozzle, I'm thinking. Maybe the Z offset is slightly too high. I'm getting areas like that, areas around here, which indicates it's not enough squish on the build plate, I would think. And then up towards the top there, it's just, it's not terrible. I mean, for a 3D printed piece, it's still a good looking piece. It's just when you compare it to some of the other machines that come out without any of these flaws, it's kind of why it's not part of the print farm. It's why it's part of my personal shelf. And the other day we released the Elegoo's Rapid PETG versus Bamboo's PETG HF. So if you haven't checked that one out, be sure to go do that. We learned some interesting things, sort of. The strength test was more for me than it was for you, I guess, because I don't have any scientific way of actually showing you how strong they are. And me breaking things with my hands doesn't show you anything other than I can break things. So, or I guess in that case that I couldn't break things, I don't know. However, if you haven't seen that one, I did choose to switch to the Bamboo PETG HF for printing all of the sander holders coming forward only because I do like that more matte sheen and it is a little bit cheaper than the Anycubic that I'm using right now. The only issue I'm having is I can get these on the A1 Mini to print great on the Anycubic, but I'm having some issues with cooling. So I'm thinking I need to ramp up the uh, cooling settings for this PETG HF or maybe turn down the print temperature. I guess I didn't really think of that. Maybe I'll try that. And it got so close but it had a, a little shift there. I probably should have used a brim on it like I do on the other ones. But the overall print quality, where it actually got up to before it broke loose, it's not bad. I suppose I can try lowering the Z offset just a little bit and see if we can get it to stick better. Let's go in here and tell it to print the nozzle again. So this is the bed mesh that I added to the start of the G code. I also upped it from a 7x7 seven seven point uh, bed mesh to a 9x9 nine nine point bed mesh. So essentially anytime I'm changing between printing say PLA at 60 or 65 and going to PETG at like 75 or 80, I like to have it redo the bed mesh because hotter temperatures the bed 
tends to expand a little bit and can increase or decrease the Z offset depending on uh, what type of materials you're printing and how hot the bed is. So that is what it's doing right now, only because I just reran this file. We already did that for this, so it wasn't really necessary, but I'm just going to adjust the Z offset down by 0 0.01 in the screen and see if that makes a difference at all. All right, that second print that I ran finished up just fine. No issues there. Uh, supports were, eh, whatever. They did what they did. I think they came loose at the top a little bit because that's about as clean as it was without supports over on the 5M Pro. So I just loaded up this file one more time, except I did this one in ludicrous mode. So that's like 400 millimeters per second around the outer wall and I think 500 on the inner wall. So that should be pretty insane to watch. 20 minutes on the clock. This is real time. Tell me that's not insane. And keep in mind, this is just a matte PLA. This isn't even like a high speed material that's, you know, meant for printing at 500 millimeters per second, but here it is. Just over 50% finished now. And I'm not going to pretend like this is the cleanest print in the world by any means, but this would take like 18 hours on my Ender 3 Max Neo, and it still wouldn't come out looking half as good as this. And just for full honesty here, FL Sun did send me this printer for free for the use in my videos. Same with Flash Forge for the uh, 5M Pro. All of the Bamboo Lab machines and the Creality's I purchased with my own money. With that said, neither of the companies paid me for reviewing any of these printers. In fact, they don't even get a look at any of the videos that I put out before you do. You're still not getting it before it goes out, but I do appreciate your consistency. So I just felt the need to let you know uh, my thoughts on this machine and all of the other machines, including the ones I've paid for, uh, are all of my own. And I was a little critical of this thing at the beginning before I got it tuned up. So take that for what it's worth. 96% complete, about 22 minutes in. Again, not the cleanest thing here, but we're printing uh, matte PLA at 500 millimeters per second. So what do you expect? And now that I've had a chance to try out the PLA at 500 millimeters per second for this outer wall, I want to try something that's got a little bit of infill. Is 800 millimeters per second versus 500 is kind of an insane increase. Right off the build plate, adhesion was really good. Part quality. I mean, I can't break it. Up here, obviously, I can. But even in areas like that center, actually, I don't know that I... I will break that there. Nope. It just bends. So, I, I mean... 500 millimeters per second, 22 minutes. It's fugly, but uh, kind of works. So if you're just, you know, using this to design the vacuum adapter, test it to see does the inside here fit, maybe slow it down a little bit for these outer walls. But in the next video, we are going to see how absolutely insane this thing is printing some larger items. And that's where I'm going to wrap this one up, folks. I want to thank you so much for joining me today. Just me giving my thoughts out, showing you what I got going on here in the shop. And again, thank you to FL Sun and Flash Forge for sending over both of their printers. I also have links to the Bamboo Lab machines down there, as well as all of the filament that I use, packing materials, and all that good stuff. If you're not subscribed, make sure you hit that subscribe button and the thumbs up if you enjoyed today's video. Until next time, take care, folks.